Hello. Welcome. I'm Gina Vild. I'm the Associate Dean for Communications and External Relations and Chief Communications Officer for Harvard Medical School. I'm delighted to see you here tonight. Before we begin, I think it's really a, would be nice to take a moment to honor the victims of last week's tragic events, those who lost their lives, and the 282 men, women, and children who were injured. I also want to recognize as part of this the remarkable Harvard Medical School community. You may be aware that many of our caregivers were first responders on Monday and on Friday. And many other Harvard Medical School caregivers will continue to care for those who were hurt in the days and months to come. To honor the victims and the caregivers tonight, I, I'd like to share with you a um, portion of a letter that our Dean, Jeffrey Flyer, sent to the Harvard Medical School community. He wrote, there is a certain type of individual who runs toward disaster, whose hands reach out to others during times of unspeakable tragedy. Some use the word hero to describe these individuals, those who led the remarkable response to yesterday's attack. But for those at Harvard Medical School, this response is simply a vocation. Medical professionals are often on the front lines of crisis, and such was the case on Monday when two explosions at the Boston Marathon finish line resulted in deaths and injuries of the type more common to the battlefield than to the streets of Boston. All of us were profoundly shaken by the day's horrific events. At Brigham and Women's Hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Boston Children's Hospital, and Mass Ioneer Infirmary, doctors, nurses, medical students, and staff heroically performed the difficult work for which we have been trained and to which we have devoted our lives. This expert skill and dedication illustrate why Boston hospitals have earned a reputation as best in the world. I know we join with him in, in, with these concluding remarks. It's clear that the Harvard Medical School, Medical School community has united in an extraordinary way during these ex this extremely difficult time, doing the life-saving work required to care for the injured. To those Harvard Medical School caregivers and those who support them, we offer our respect, admiration, and sincere gratitude. It may be timely that tonight's seminar is on the topic of the individual belief system and its relationship to our overall health. The seminar is not focused on a specific faith or religion, but rather on an individual belief system. Whatever it is that you believe and how you choose to practice those beliefs. For some it is prayer, for others it's meditation, for some it's yoga. Whatever your belief system, many of us have not considered the impact it has on our health. Our speakers tonight will discuss the powerful mind-body connection and the links between spirituality and health. The topic was prompted by an article entitled Beyond Belief from a recent issue of Harvard Medicine Magazine. The article can be found in the list of supplemental reading materials, but I also want you to know you can sign up to receive our e-magazine by contacting the website along with seminars at hms.harvard.edu. So tonight, just a few, a few announcements. I'm delighted to tell you that more than 400 people will receive certificates by attending this year's seminars. So to all of you who have been here for three or more seminars, thank you for being a part of our Longwood Seminar family. You can pick up your certificate in the lobby. I also want you to know that we began live streaming this event this year. And in the first three events, the first three seminars, we've had over 30 countries join us. So for those of you who are joining us from afar, we welcome you. And just to give you a sense of how vast our audience is, in the last three seminars, we had people viewing from Japan, Portugal, Egypt, Lebanon, Peru, China, Canada, Slovakia, Mexico, and Algeria, to name just a few countries. Um, and just a few words on how you can engage with us with the Longwood Seminars online. We now have a mobile app, which you may know, and you can get all kinds of information on the Longwood Seminars, as well as our supplemental reading material. You can find videos of the first three seminars on our website. 
And the supplemental reading material can also be found online. If you do not have a computer, our staff will help you locate Boston Public Libraries where you can access a computer. In the coming weeks, we're going to be sending out an electronic survey, and I invite all of you to fill it out, complete it, and give us your thoughts on how you think we did this year in terms of offering the Longwood Seminar programs and what you would like to see next year. Teachers who want to earn professional development points by attending all four seminars, please pick up your form in the lobby. We hope we have a very spirited debate and discussion tonight, and we have index cards in the lobby, which we invite you to complete, and we'll be able, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our two speakers. And as we've done uh, for earlier seminars, we're live tweeting tonight. Please use hashtag HMS Minimed if you'd like to participate in our discussion. And please turn off your cell phones. Before I introduce the speakers, I would like to introduce you to a member of our communications team who's been responsible for hosting all of the Longwood seminars. This is her third year, and she's done an extraordinary job. Katie DeBoff. She <laughs> Katie. Katie introduced last year's seminar, the, the last seminar when I was away, and we just want to thank you for all of your great work. Through her efforts, we've really expanded access to the seminars. Thank you, Katie. Our speakers tonight. We're thrilled to introduce you to two internationally recognized speakers, experts from Harvard, who study the science behind personal belief and health. Dr. Herb Benson, whom I've known for a very long time, is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's also the director emeritus of the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. But first, we're going to welcome to the podium Ted Kapchuk. Ted is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and directs the program of placebo studies and therapeutic encounter at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. His scientific and scholarly career has involved multidisciplinary investigation of placebo effects that integrates concepts, research designs, analytic methods drawn from the basic clinical and social sciences as well as from the humanities. Dr. Kapchuk will be speaking with us tonight about the placebo effect as it relates to beliefs. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here on, on a kind of gloomy evening. I uh, hope the debate here and the discussion here will be um, warming. Uh, first, I want to say that I'm really honored to be here with Dr. Benson. Uh, Herb has been my mentor since 1976. Um, he's been very, and, and my first academic appointment, I was told a year after I got appointed that I, they would never have hired me if it wasn't for Herb Benson's pioneering work on mind-body effects, made it more credible that I could possibly do something. And I'm really honored, uh, and I think we should, and uh, uh, all of us owe a debt to Dr. Benson for really pioneering the question of mind-body in health and illness. Um, uh, the topic, um, I, I was told to talk about belief, and I said, why don't you get someone from divinity school? That's not what I do. And then I guess they told me that you're as close as we have at the medical school that deals with this stuff. So I said, well, I'm not sure I can really talk about belief directly. So what I, I, what I do study is placebo effects, and what I'm gonna do is present some information, even data, um, relevant, and then I'm gonna give some beliefs, uh, <laughs> some opinions on the question of belief faith and personal health, and then I will sit down and let Dr. Benson tell us the truth and, and, and actually make it more clear. Um, first thing I want to say is a placebo is a, is an inert sugar pill. That's what it usually means. Uh, the placebo effect has, is a nonsense, right? It's oxymoron, the effect of something that has no effect. What it is, is actually the way we measure everything that surrounds the act of giving a pill, everything that surrounds the act of getting an injection. It's the context of healing that it's what it is um, essentially a question of investigation for. Um, that said, what I'm going to do is, I, oh, I did say what I'm going to do. And uh, so now I'm going to proceed. So I, uh, please forgive me if I don't answer data on the question of faith. It's really hard to measure faith. 
Um, you know what I mean? Uh, so, that's, so that's why it's so scarce in this side of the river as opposed to the other side of the river at the Divinity School. But Dr. Benson has spent a career, uh, I've spent my career trying to measure the intangibles of healthcare in, in the context of clinical encounter. Um, so what I wanted to say first is that when you want to find out whether a drug works, you don't give a drug and say, let's see if it works. That's what you do clinically, but scientists have a different sense of, 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 of how you understand whether something works. You have to have comparison. And the placebo, the sugar pill, the saline injection, even the sham surgery is that comparator. If it works more than the ritual without the active ingredient, you say, that really is an effective drug. So how do you know whether placebo works? You have to have a comparator. Do you understand what I mean? Because the tinkature of time is probably one of the most potent remedies we have in healthcare. And how do you know it's more than just waiting for time to take its place? How do you know it's not? How do you know it's not that? And how do you know it's actually the clinical encounter and the psychosocial mind-body effects to go on in the ritual of healing? So I wanted to show you how um, most of the time I do, uh, how most of the time I re my team does its research. And the question is, how do you control for the placebo? What's in the placebo arm of a randomized control trial normally? Well, the first thing is um, a dummy treatment, a sugar pill, saline injection. That's a placebo effect, because that has no effect, and it's a psychosocial cultural effect. Everyone see what I mean? It's some symbolic ritual. The second thing that's in the placebo arm of a randomized controlled trial is a patient-practitioner relationship. That's kind of absurd. I would never call my doctor a placebo. But when you do drug develop, well, I mostly won't call my doctor a placebo. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> it would be good if they were a good placebo, wouldn't it? Um, so uh, but it, it's absurd to call that a placebo effect, except when you do drug development, it's in the placebo arm, and it's a psychosocial phenomena. It's a an encounter between human beings. It's not the drug, it's not the, the, um, the drug that you're testing. So the, in terms of how medicine usually perceives the, the patient-doctor relationship, it's included as part of the placebo effect, but it's different than the, tr the effect of a dummy pill. Other things inside the placebo arm of a randomized control trial are spontaneous remission. We all get better, right? When we go to the dentist, the pain sort of goes away before you get there. Um, that happens not infrequently. Uh, and major illnesses, severe illnesses, um, sometimes get better by themselves. That's also, um, there's something called regression to the mean. Um, it's a statistical artifact. If you take someone in there in a lot of pain, usually it goes down a bit statistically if you measure it twice. Um, natural fluctuations is similar. I'm not gonna do that one, it's too hard. Physical co-interventions, when you're sick, you lie down and you, um, and you get better food and you take care of yourself a little better. That's not a placebo effect, that's the effect of nurturing, the physical nurturing that is given, hopefully, to most people when they're sick. So how do we control for the, in, in medical research, and this doesn't work, let's see if this works. Yeah, how do we control for these things that are not placebo effects in randomized, that are not placebo effects in the placebo arm, so we can find out what the mind-body effect is of the placebo. And what we do, and we call that all this stuff, which is very important stuff, the noise that we have to separate from the placebo, and what do we, how do we control the, that noise so we can get at this mind-body effect? Well, there's two ways of doing it. One is a no-treatment arm. If you randomize people to a control that is no treatment, doesn't have the dummy treatment, doesn't have the patient-doctor relationship, people, but it does have the tincture of time, that controls for, so, at least as a, a relatively good control, for things that are in the placebo arm that are not a placebo effect. Does everyone follow that, I hope? That was pretty good for me to explain. And the other way, <laughs> the other way of controlling that noise, all these things, is two dosages of a drug in a drug trial, which means that if you give someone 10 milligrams of a drug and you give them in a pill and you give them five milligrams of a pill that looks identical, if you get a different effect, you're controlling for time and the appearance and the psychosocial factors. So giving two placebos could be a way of two different dosage, quote, of placebo. That could be a way of controlling for finding out, is this really a placebo effect or is it the tincture of time? Um, so, 
In the trial, I'm going, to, I'm going to just present two experiments. They're very easy to follow and they're fun, especially the second one. They're both really interesting. Um, um, the first experiment is that we decided that we would um, give two dosages of placebo. And if there was a difference, we were measuring some kind of difference because of whatever we manipulated. And the other thing this trial had, it was also had a no treatment control. So we had actually two controls for the placebo effect. Um, and um, then we published this paper in MBMJ in 2008. Um, the trial is, it looks complicated in that diagram, but it's actually pretty simple. We recruited uh, a 262 patients with irritable bowel syndrome at the Beth Israel Deaconess. Um, and we randomized them to three arms. We, irritable bowel syndrome is a really uh, very difficult illness to treat. It's very uncomfortable. It has abdominal pain related to uh, constipation or diarrhea. And it's one of the 10 top reasons people go to doctors. It's a very uncomfortable, unpleasant um, medical condition. What we did in the trial is we randomized people to three arms. One arm was a wait list, no treatment at all. Everyone's, what that meant was they saw our GI doc who's been voted the best of Boston for 10 years uh, in different years, not consecutively, and he is really good just meeting him, right? Uh, unfortunately, so we had to get better than him, and we did nothing. We just took the measurements at baseline at three weeks and at six weeks. No treatment, okay? That's our base, that's our no treatment control. The second arm of the trial, we randomized them to what we call the limited placebo intervention, a low dose. And what we did there is, the, and we used placebo acupuncture. I'll show you a picture of the placebo needles in a second. Um, they look, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, it looks like a placebo, but it's actually a magic needle that goes up the shaft and, and you, it actually doesn't penetrate your skin. It's an, a very clever device. Um, and the first time someone, I'm an acupuncturist by training uh, originally, and the first time someone gave me the placebo needle, I felt the scratch, I saw it go, and it stayed in my hand. I said, Conrad, you gave me the wrong needle. It's a very good, very clever device. <laughs> um, so, uh, no, 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 how do I do this, go back. Um, so they came, so the, pap uh, the patient were randomized to this arm, and this arm was the patient came in. I'm going to use you, um, Joey, for it. Just stay there. I just need someone to look at. And um, the patient came in, and the, ac the practitioner who's using placebo acupuncture said, "Hi, my name my name is Ted, and this is a scientific experiment. I've read your charts. I know exactly what to do because it's a scientific experiment." I'm not gonna to talk to you except to tell you to turn over and whether something hurts or not. If you have any questions, ask the study nurse, the study physician, the study coordinator. We cut the doctor-patient relation right out. Everyone see what we did? And it was amazing, people still wanted to be in the study, but they did. They, they, we, it was both, an, uh, I'll explain this a little bit, okay? The second arm, um, the, the third arm, okay, so this is, and they were treated for six, three weeks with placebo acupuncture, which is, uh, I'll show you a picture, um, twice, twice a week. And then at three weeks, they're re-randomized to have, continue on this placebo treatment or to real acupuncture. And anyone that got fake acupuncture at the end of the trial was given the opportunity to have real acupuncture if they wanted to. And the third arm was what we call the augmented placebo. So Joe, you're my patient. So people, uh, the, pa the practitioner would come in and say, hi, my name is Ted. I read your chart. Tell me what this illness has been like for you. And they talk and they say, well, how does it affect your family? How does it affect your friends? Can you go to restaurants? Can you go to movies? Um, what, do you, what do you think caused this illness? And then there's a brief medical intake, a, a, a brief psychosocial intake, you know, what kind of emotions that are common in this. And then they ask them, um, and they had to do five things besides those, that intake that we, the entire study, every minute of the study was filmed. We had to be sure, the NIH wanted to know that we really delivered what we said we were going to deliver. And what they did was they had to have attentive listening. They had to repeat what the patient said. Is that what you said? Isn't that what you mean? They had to have empathy. I know people that have had this experience, this illness. It is really a hard illness to treat. But I have, and I understand that. Third was they had to have confidence. I've, these were senior practitioners of acupuncture, and they said, I've treated lots of people. I'm really excited to show the medical community whether acupuncture works or not. They had to have confidence. I forgot. And uh, there were a couple other things, uh, uh, warmth, 
And, and then the final thing we really made sure that it would work, we thought it would make it work, um, was we had to have 20 seconds, they had to have 20 seconds of silence. Say, I heard everything, let me think about this for a few moments and make sure I understand everything you told me. You know that cured everyone right away, right? And, and it helped everyone. And then we said, um, and then we'd ask another question to clarify, make sure we, and then we, and we proceeded with these identical six with the identical six treatments we used here of fake acupuncture, and then they were re-randomized at three weeks to continue on the fake placebo or to have real acupuncture. And anyone who had only fake needles were then given the opportunity to have real acupuncture if they wanted at the end. Everyone, it's not a complicated, it's a miserable slide, but it's actually pretty, it's, it's, it's an interesting study design. This is the needle, the way it looked. Um, the real needles look identical, and the fake needles look identical. And the fake needle, instead of going in the skin, actually goes up the shaft, and it's not on an acupuncture point. It's really a, a nice placebo device. There were four outcome measures. Um, they were very simple. I mean, the ones that the FDA uses for, um, sorry. One that the FDA, the ones the FDA used for approving a drug for irritable bowel syndrome. Adequate relief is a binary. Are you, did you have adequate relief in the last seven days? This is a seven point scale, this is a 500 point scale. This is a quality of life scale. They're all validated for this particular illness. The quality of life is can you go to movies, can you drink wine, things like that. And our hypothesis was that the augmented placebo was bigger than the limited placebo, and that was bigger than the wait list in a way that be a, a dose-dependent, analogous to a dose-dependent relationship. So what happened? Are you ready for the results? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to present uh, the main one. I'll present there, uh, all, the res all four outcomes were, the si were basically similar. I'll just explain the first out. This outcome is the easiest to follow. This is the adequate relief. If you did nothing and just waited, think it's your time, it was 27% of people reported improvement, okay? If you got just a fake needle but no doctor-patient relationship, it's about, I can't see it, but I think it's 47% improvement. That really did something. But if you got the, the entire schmaltz of the doctor-patient relationship, you got 62% adequate relief in this study. The other outcomes were similar. The main outcome, our main the statistical test was a uh, test for trends. It was very significant. And basically, we were able to show that, and I'll show the next thing here. This is at six weeks, it's identical. It's actually stronger at half the number of patients. And basically, we were able to show that you could administer placebos in a way that's analogous, not quite exactly like a dose, but analogous to a dose dependent. There's something real here. There's something consequential, consequential here. There's something here that actually changes people's illness. Everyone see that? This is a good study. Um, the other thing that I should mention is that these, are, these two drugs are very rarely used for irritable bowel. Um, they were put on the market and then taken off the market because of adverse effects. Then patients who had the, the disease petitioned the FDA to put it back on the market. In order to get that drug, you have to sign that you understand the nature of the side effects. The, the magnitude of the effects were not bigger than our study. That's pretty intense, isn't it? Okay. So I wanted, to, now I'm gonna sort of try to get at what's happened here um, in our study. And what I, we did was hire an anthropologist from the other side of the river um, to go in and interview a patient because I was tired of reading about my patients in questionnaires. I wanted to hear what they had to say. This is the first randomized control trial that asked patients what happened to them in their own words, right? And these, and these patients that when I'm presenting the only uh, ones that had only placebos. Um, so it's, and this, this is going to try to get to the question of belief and stuff. I haven't, uh, this is, uh, we've published this in a lot of different places. I haven't anything to lose. Patients, we asked them, did you expect to get better? All our patients says, are you kidding? I've been to 10 GI docs before here. I've been on every medication in the world. How do you think I, did, did this wouldn't have the pink tutu? Uh, yeah? Is there anything about pink dresses? I'm sorry, I'll try, if you told me to wear pink every day, I would do it. People were desperate. And this was like no one had ever noticed. Everyone said, well, people on placebo think they're going to get the real drug and therefore they get better. These are people who don't express positive expectations. That was, by the way, that's not supposed to be true according to the, before we asked patients what they felt about what was going on. 
The second thing was people were going nuts. We said, we were told, as I'm a placebo researcher, I was told by, not by Dr. Benson, but by other mentors, that, <laughs> that people in randomized control trials forget they may be on placebo and they think they're on the drug. Well, we asked people at the end of the trial, so did you think you're on placebo? Every one of them had a concrete way of thinking it was a placebo. They worried about it every day. Am I on the real drug or not? And they'd say things like, maybe it's the treatments aren't even real, so how do I know if it's anything to do with that? People were worried about, maybe I made it up in my own head. Uh, people were worried, uh, people were just really worried and anxious that they were on placebo. That's interesting, because that's not supposed to have happened. And we've replicated this in other studies, it's true. And I just wanted to say, some people on placebo really had some dramatic changes <laughs> that were not recorded in our uh, questionnaires on the standardized IBS questionnaires. These are real quotes, and they're real. Oh, I'm gonna go back there. Um, Oh, come on, how do I do this? Oh, this way. I have, I'm dyslexic, I can't. I'm not gonna be able to use the laser, I lost it, okay. Um, uh, the things like, I've taken steps to leave my husband. I was talking to my wife yesterday, I said, I don't know, maybe it's this, maybe it's the acupuncture. I used to raise my voice and get angry a lot, now I'm much better. People had dramatic changes that no one would have recorded if we didn't have the anthropologist from across the river saying, hey, what happened to you? So that was interesting. The, this effect, whatever it is, is very potent. So then the question, I don't know what the next slide is. Oh, and what we, we realized is that when we looked at our patients in these studies, that ambiguity and uncertainty was a constant. It wasn't faith. It was like doubt also. It was hope. Oh, I forgot to say, every one of our patients says, I had hope. Not that I had, because people have doubt, you know, people want, that's why they came in. It's like, if you didn't have expectations, why'd you come in? I have hope. I'm open to new experiences. Um, and, and the imaginative process was very active. Um, so this gave us, this study is more fun even. Um, this study, so this gave us the, so people, if you do placebo research, the ethics committee is always worried about you because you know, placebos involve concealment, deception maybe. And so I said, I can't live my whole life with, um, every time I go into the IRB, they get upset with me and they say, oh God, this guy's gonna ask us to do something that we're not gonna let him do. And I said, you know, let me, I just looked at all these patients that we did, read the transcripts that we did, and I said, you know, they're going crazy. It's not certainty that's making them feel better. It's something else about openness to new experience. It's something about hope. It's something that we're not, it's not some dummy's thing. Something else is going on here. So what I decided to do is give, um, give patients placebos, tell them it's placebos, and see what it did. And as a comparison, we gave them a no treatment control, which for the act, for controlling for the tinkature of time, right? Everyone see what I, the experiment is? I'll, maybe this next slide, oh, next slide will have it. We randomize 80 people and at, uh, to either open label placebo, or honest placebo, this is a placebo. It has no active ingredients, but we think there may be a mind-body effect, try it out. Because we figured they were going crazy anyways. Why don't we let, let them go crazy and see what we can do without being dishonest, right? Uh, it's not that, I don't want to, I mean, people, this, everyone was, yeah, everyone was going through something. Um, and so the bottle said placebo. When they called up, we advertised a, mind, a novel mind-body uh, intervention. When they called up, the people said, people who asked, what is the intervention? It's a placebo. And they said, you must be kidding. And we said, no, no, we're not kidding. This is really what we're going to do. And they said, are you really serious? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And people came in. It was very easy to recruit. People, and that may be the reason that it was so successful. People were really desperate and wanted to try anything, right? Every, my GI doc, who I loved intensely, said, Ted, don't make me do this experiment. I do not want to do this. And I said, Tony, someone's got to do this once in history. We've got to do it. And so uh, he was kind enough to do it with me, Dr. Lembo at the, at the BID. And so the said placebo, we had them right, sign next to the informed consent. You understand you're getting a sugar, uh, something like a sugar pill with no active ingredient. People signed. And uh, I just, uh, the adequate relief one, because I just, uh, is this one? Adequate relief. It was the same outcome. 62, 63% adequate relief compared to about a 34% adequate relief. We got some effect. And what I wanna do is show you um, two patients who gave us approval, uh, IRB, it gave us ethics to um, record them. One's from a TV program, one's from uh, NPR. I think if you're listening to this via, via the internet, 
Uh, we're not going to be able to broadcast that because of copyright, but people in the room will be able to watch this um, video. Okay. So, uh, so I wanted to just say, what, what, this is kind of crazy. They knew that it was a fake pill, but they also got experience of real concrete benefit. We recently uh, did an experiment in published in P Proceedings National Academy of Sciences. We were able to give people the environmental cue they're getting a positive drug or a negative drug, but they weren't able to see it consciously. We did it subliminally, and we were able to get placebo effects and nocebo effects without the intervention of the conscious mind. But the, the uh, somehow or another, we communicated non-consciously below the level of consciousness. So that's one of the ways we think about this experiment. I'm not going to do these. Um, and I wanted to give a set of opinions uh, and then let Dr. Benson clarify this and give us some experiential knowledge. Um, uh, what do I think about what I just presented, these two simple experiments? Um, first, I wanted to say that I don't think you can think yourself well. I don't, I don't believe our patients thought themselves well. I think they immersed themselves in an experience, in a clinical situation with, with providers that cared, even providers that couldn't even care, but it was a caring situation. It was a trusting situation. I think that um, I don't think it's necessarily consciously aware of what's going on, but it's this kind of openness to new experiences. I think that thing of faith and, and uh, belief is related to motivation, adherence, cooperation, trust, patience, endurance, and acceptance. I don't think there's evidence to say that um, if you think something, you're going to get better. I, don't, I haven't seen that, uh, that evidence. I'm just, that's my personal reading of it, but it's an opinion. Maybe Dr. Benson will say something differently. I think positive conscious expectation, expectations are not necessary to get a placebo effect. And, and, or a drug effect in a laboratory. I, I forget that. Evidence, um, the evidence that if you expect to get better, I don't think it's there, that expectation totally works. If you think you're gonna get better, you're gonna get better. There's something deeper than that, and I, I would call it embodied mind or mind in the, a mindful body. Um, it's something that's really deep, felt, and experienced. And let's see. Um, and next thing is, there's no clear evidence that religious faith by spirituality uh, leads to good health, at least on this side of the river. I don't know about the other side of the river. Um, there's a, the idea that the mind can cure. I think that the mind has potentials, but it's also the embodied mind. It's the body, the, the knowing that's below what we think we know. It's a deeper knowing. I just wanted to say that a lot of um, ideas, for instance, yoga and, and vegetarianism, um, originally are not to make you healthy, right? Yoga is to transcend the body. Vegetarianism, which used to be called Pythagoreanism until 1900, uh, was a way of over kind of transcending the body. And we've made it a leap as the divinity school became less important in our lives and the medical school becomes more important in our lives. God becomes less important, the physician becomes more important. We've um, cannibalized the idea of belief and say it's really, a, it'll give us, um, in my opinion, will give us health. What I think it gives us is perseverance, trust, and openness to new experiences. And that may or may not lead to um, some changes that we have. But right now, I'm going to take the position um, that it's more than you think yourself you're going to get better. Though that's a good thing, and it's, but I think it's a deeper level of knowing that I don't think medicine knows much about yet, except maybe um, Dr. Benson certainly has many more years of experience than I do. And I think the Divinity School is um, still trying to struggle is what is this that we call faith and belief? And I hope that I've given some things to think about. And now let's hear from Dr. Benson um, on this question. Thank you. That was fascinating. And now, Dr. Benson, um, we'd like to welcome you. Dr. Benson is a pioneer in the mind-body medicine and one of the first Western physicians to introduce spirituality and healing to medicine. In his career spanning more than four decades, he has defined the relaxation response, which many of you have heard of, and continues to lead teaching and research into its efficacy in counteracting the harmful effects of stress. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. One of the beautiful things of getting older is to see your students mature and 
and produce enormously. And I thank you, Ted, for all of your kind remarks, and thank you for your career and what you're offering to everyone. Thank you. I want to speak primarily about stress and what it can do to you. Stre by stress, I mean any situation that requires behavioral adjustment. What's happening to us this last week is a perfect example of stress. Who would have thunk it? I mean, look at what, how it's changed our lives. There virtually is no conversation starting these days amongst people that doesn't refer, at least in Boston, to this phenomena. It's, and stress evokes what's called the fight or flight response. It prepares you for running or for fighting. Perceived stress is not a tiger in front of you, but it's the thought of what might happen to me, a what if situation. And I'll get into this later, but particularly, it's a human trait that we have where we can anticipate issues, and this has been very important in our evolution. But there's a downside to this, over 60%, 60 to 90% of visits to healthcare professionals or in the healthcare realm. I'm going to be emphasizing that throughout my talk tonight. But I don't want to minimize the importance of the medicines that work, the surgeries that work. How many of you would not be alive today were it not for uh, a medicine or a surgical procedure? Could I have a show of hands today? Huh. A majority of you, it's certainly true in my case. Um, about 10 or so years ago, I was putting plastic up across the air conditioning vents of our Lexington home to keep away the drafts of winter using masking tape, not scotch tape, because scotch tape come spring would be a difficult thing to get off. And I knew it would peel, but I was prepared throughout the, the winter to tack it back up. Well, later that day, walking to my shower through the kitchen with just a towel around myself, I looked up, and sure enough, it was peeling. And I had this internal dialogue go on, oh, don't be compulsive, don't stand on the chair, it's unstable. I didn't listen, stood on the chair, scooted out from under me, I fell hitting my ribs across the long edge of a, 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 a butcher block table, and there writhing, I, there the pain was terrible, and th th there I was writhing naked on the floor. <laughs> my wife came in, saw me, and said, what are you doing there? <laughs> so I, I tried to explain, don't worry, it's all right, it's, it's uh, It'll go away. The pain didn't go away. She said, should I call our neighbor? I said, uh, uh, physician, I said, you'd better. He wasn't home. She said, 911. I said, OK. They quickly came. But before they came, do you want to put on some underwear? So I said, OK. So I did so. And they came. And they were taking me out. And I said, take me you know, the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. There wasn't time. We have to take you to Leahy, which is right around the corner. I knew I was in trouble, not because it was Leahy Clinic, but because they wouldn't take me into Boston. So I wanted something meaningful to come out of this that people would remember me by. So carrying me out there, I called them closer, and they said yes. And I, my wife was there, and I said, this is worse than childbirth. Well, in one millisecond, all compassion drained from her face. And she quickly said, how would you know? Well, I knew nothing good was going to come out of that. I had broken five, four ribs. I had punctured my lung. The lung had collapsed. And it was, it was a condition called tension pneumothorax, where the pressure on one side would be communicated to the other. And that lung would collapse, and I'd, I'd die. They quickly diagnosed that, and put a tube in my chest, sucked out the blood and fluid, my lung expanded, my life was saved. 
no amount what Ted Kapchuk and I are talking about today will constitute that kind of cure. And how many of you had your lives saved by medications and surgeries. But we are talking about something that needs the respect of being recognized, namely that 60 to 90% of visits to healthcare professionals are in the mind-body stress-related realm. What are the diseases? Anxiety, depression, excessive anger, high blood pressure, um, heart attacks, strokes, irritable bowel syndrome, um, irritable bowel disease, pregnancy, rheumatoid arthritis are all influenced by stress. And there is no effective treatment for stress. So there's no pill, there's no surgery. I came upon this through my studies of hypertension in the early days when I was consistently over-medicating my patients because they had high blood pressure, not recognizing that the measurement itself, subsequently called white coat hypertension, the white coat of a physician or a nurse being stressful and that leading to the high blood pressure. So I returned to Harvard Medical Schools from which I had graduated to see whether or not we couldn't set up an animal model for stress-induced high blood pressure. We used the work of B.F. Skinner uh, of Harvard University and reinforced rewarded monkeys for having higher blood pressure. And soon we could train the monkeys to get the reward, would develop high blood pressure, and then go on to pass away of either strokes or kidney disease directly related to the high blood pressure, showing for essentially the first time that stress can be related to high blood pressure. And high blood pressure is so important because it's directly related to strokes and heart attacks. We reported this, and then um, young people, and we're talking about 1967, 68, came to me and said, why are you fooling around with monkeys? We think we can effectively control our blood pressure. We practice transcendental meditation. Well, I was already being told that my career was in jeopardy, studying stress, and meditation was a different world. So, and I didn't want to chance that, so I said no. They wouldn't go away, kept coming back, asking to be studied, and finally I decided what was there to lose. And this was at a time when there weren't IRBs, Institutional Review Boards, where human studies committees. So I brought people to the laboratory at Harvard Medical School, Building C, right across the street there, and had an experiment where we instrumented them with intravenous catheters, uh, intraarterial catheters, mass to collect their outbreath so we could measure metabolism, belts around their chest so we could measure respiration, electrodes on their scalp so we could measure the electrocardiograms, electrodes on their, their chest so we'd mes uh, measure um, uh, I'm sorry, brain waves, electroencephalograms, and electrocardiograms by the electrodes on the chest. Had them sit for a while to get used to the um, stuff in them and on them, and then divided the period, the, an hour, into three periods. 20 minutes of sitting, 20 minutes of sit, and, and just thinking regular thoughts, 20 minutes of sitting and meditating, and 20 minutes of thinking regular thoughts. No change in posture, no change in activity. What were the changes? And what we found were dramatic changes in the metabolism of the body. This is important. The overall energy being burned by the body by the simple act of meditating was decreased 17%. Their whole carbon dioxide elimination decreased. Um, their rate of breathing dropped 25% from 14, 15 breaths per minute to 5 or 10 breaths per minute. It was a different state. And it looked opposite to the fight or flight stress response. 
In fact, this work was done in the very room at Harvard Medical School in which 25 years before Walter B. Cannon had described the fight or flight response, where with cats he removed their adrenal glands, ground them up, injected it into others, cats, and found increased blood pressure, rate of breathing, metabolism, all of which were the fight or flight response. And it made no sense that transcendental meditation would be the only way to bring this about. So I thought, well, what, are the, what, are, what do people do in meditation? Ultimately, it came down to two steps. One was a repetition. That repetition could be a word, a sound, a prayer, a phrase, or a, a, a repetitive movement. The second was, when other thoughts came to mind, you disregard them and come back to the repetition. And what those two steps do is to break the train of everyday thinking. Break the train of everyday thinking. The very thinking that frequently evokes the, the um, fight or flight response. Can I drive to work? Will there be a bomb going off? Am I going to lose my job? Is my child's illness that serious? Or am I going to lose a spouse? Am I going to lose a parent? Will I go broke? All of these evoke the fight or flight response. But when you do one of these steps that evoke this opposite response, you're breaking such a train of thought. And then I thought, what are the historical precedents for this? And here I was getting in another sphere. I knew nothing about this type of thing, but I spent several years looking at the religious and secular literatures of the world to see whether or not these steps were there. And it was scary. Every single culture of humankind had these two steps. It all started um, in India with yoga with meditation and where people would, for example, with yoga, have a repetitive movement as they were focusing on their breathing. In Judaism, there was mercabalism where people would kneel in a fetal-like posture, rock from heel to toe, heel to toe, and on each out breath repeat the name of a magic seal over and over again. Gershom Sholem has dis beautifully described this. Within Christianity, prayers um, developing about the time of, um, um, of, of uh, the second, third, and fourth centuries where um, monks, hermits, uh, desert fathers living in the deserts north of Cairo would kneel, focus on their breathing, and each out breath repeat the word Jesus as they experience uh, as they disregarded other thoughts. Then, in about the 10th or so century, there was a work in England called the Cloud of Unknowing, where this prayer, this approach was repeated. And then on Mount Athos in Greece, the Greek monks would kneel, focus on their breathing, and repeat Christe eleison, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And exactly the same in Islam, where the process is called dhikr, D-H-I-K-R. And in Soto Zen Buddhism and, and, and Shintoism, Taoism, same steps. So we said, OK, if this be the case, we should be able to replicate what we found in Transcendental Meditation. So we brought in bright Harvard medical students were allowed to do so in those days, um, Simmons College students, um, um, Boston College, Boston University students, and gave them a form of Soto Zen Buddhism where they would count their outbreaths in magical numbers, but we had them count their outbreaths in regular numbers. And so we fully instrumented, they would count outbreath one, one, two, two, up to ten, back to one again. The experiment, experiment was a complete and inexorable failure. The bright students lost count, panicked, and that was the end of the experiment. <laughs> so we said, oh, okay, okay, okay. 
stay with the number one. And then when we did so, we found changes indistinguishable from those of transcendental meditation. And people have often said, isn't it wonderful you chose the number one, the oneness of God, the oneness of the universe. I said it's in truth because Harvard medical students couldn't count to 10. <laughs> but this now was science. Here was something measurable, predictable, and reproducible meeting the criteria of science. And what we were able to do over the subsequent decades was study diseases that we felt were stress-related by teaching a secularized form of evoking the relaxation response. But all the time continuing our basic science measurements. First finding, uh, publishing in Science in 1980s, early 80s, that there was a, a changes in the plasma norepinephrine, the stress hormone, actually increased when you did the relaxation response, and, but there was a blocking effect that occurred. And we started our genomic studies a few years later, that is, looking at blood samples of people who were evoking the relaxation response, and from their blood cells, their white cells, measuring their genetic activity. The genetic activity allows you to look at the genes activity. Are they increased or decreased when, when you're carrying something out? And that, that's so important because the genes generate, the, uh, the DNA of the genes uh, generate RNA, which leads to the enzymes which control virtually everything in our lives. And what we did in this experiment was take people who were long-term practitioners of various techniques that evoke the relaxation response. It included various forms of meditation. For example, mindfulness meditation, transcendental meditation, breathing meditation, various forms of yoga, vipassana yoga, other forms of yoga, repetitive prayer like saying the rosary, or breathing techniques. They had practiced the relaxation response regularly for years, an average of seven years, ranged from three years to 19 years. Control found controlled people who didn't do this at all and matched them for gender, matched them for age, matched them for education, and matched them for race. And we took their blood samples and measured all of their 20-odd thousand genes activity, seeing whether they were, in, they were different, a cross-sectional experiment. Then we took those who were the controls and taught them, and I'll show you how to do this, to evoke the relaxation response. And they did so for a eight-week period. So, then that, had, that experiment became a prospective experiment where the same people before versus after and measured their genes activity. And lo and behold, we're measuring all the genes without a basic hypothesis. They're cropped up three separate, four separate areas where the differences appeared. This work was published in the year 2000 and its definitive work will now appear next Monday in PLOS 1. And what, what are the, we found clusters of mm, 20 genes each in four different areas that were either increasing their activity or decreasing their activity. And one was energy metabolism going back to the very first things we measured in metabolism of the body. Here, the energy production, ATPAs, of the mitochondria, the, the basic energy producing cells, were down-regulated. Genes that control insulin were upgraded. Genes that control the inflammatory processes 
the immune processes of the body, centered around a molecule called NF-kappa B. Are, we're all downgraded. When you have a, a various diseases, they're upgraded. And the fourth area were the genes that were controlling apoptosis, the aging process of cells, and telomere length were all being changed appropriately. So you see, the body has within it a response that's the opposite of the fight or flight response, which can be brought forth if you take out, if you carry out steps that have been practiced for millennia. We have discovered nothing new. All we are doing is putting numbers, scientific language that can be quantifiable, reproducible, and predictable on something that's been within us for centuries, for millennia. And when you do this regularly, you can counteract the harmful effects of stress. So you see, it relates to what Ted Kapchup was just describing. It's how you can engender belief, and, but you can tailor make the belief, not your belief, not my belief, but the patient's, the client's belief by giving them a choice of a secular technique or a religious technique. And the different techniques are there. Right now, th some things are more popular than others. Uh, 40 years ago, TM was extraordinarily popular. Now it's mindfulness meditation. But people are actually murdering others when they use a different approach whether you're using Inshallah Allah or uh, Ave Maria or, or uh, Om, people will say it's important, mine is so important that I'm going to um, uh, get rid of you because you don't believe in what, what I'm believing in. But the essence of this is that we have within us either a evolutionarily derived or God-given capacity, it's your choice, the patient's choice, of which you can use, and it would be foolish not to use it. Now, in that context, would you like to experience evoking the relaxation response? Could I have a show of hands? Okay. This will be um, uh, voluntary. In other words, it's your choice. So I want to give you full informed consent, okay? Um, when you evoke the relaxation response, you get these changes occurring that reflect throughout your body that are consistent with genomic changes that are opposite to stress. But immediately after you evoke this, your mind is more open. There's a quietude, fMRI studies have clearly shown that there's a quietude in your brain and you're more open to what's said. So you be very careful about how, what I say, should you choose to evoke the relaxation response. Because um, we use this in our therapies. We um, have people evoke the relaxation response and then give them appropriate nutrition, exercise, various procedures that, that are helpful. It's also been um, used positively. Think about a Christian for example, um, uh, worship service. What follows prayer? The sermon. Open the door, get the money in. But look what Jim Jones did with this in the Guiana jungles, convincing people that drinking cyanide lace Kool-Aid was an appropriate behavior. And should you do this for a medical reason, please do so under the, uh, let your physician or healthcare professional know what you're doing. Now, each of you choose a word, a sound, a prayer or phrase that conforms to your belief system. This is voluntary. Now, it could be a secular word, the number one, the word peace, the word love, the word gentle, the word calm. Or if you're Roman Catholic, you're there. I mean, <laughs> to have experienced the repetition of the rosary 
opens the door. So, and do this in your own language. For example, it could be, it could be uh, Hail Mary full of grace, or if you're Spanish, Portuguese, or um, uh, Italian, it becomes Ave Maria. Lord is my shepherd, our Father who art in heaven. If you are of the evangelical faith, Jesus is Lord, or Lord is Jesus. If you're um, Greek Orthodox, Christe eleison. If you're Jewish, Shalom, Echod, Shema Yisrael. If you are Hindu, Om, Tibetan, Om Mani Padme Hung. So each of you, this is voluntary, choose such a word, sound, or prayer, and get things off your lap. This is the time where the um, people at Longwood Seminar steal pocketbooks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, this is voluntary. If you wish to do this, sit up and close your eyes. And relax all your muscles, starting with your feet, your calves, your thighs. Shrug your shoulders around. Roll your head and neck around. Now sit at ease without movement and breathe slowly. Now each time your breath is coming out, say silently to yourself your chosen word, sound, prayer, or phrase. And you're going to find all sorts of other thought coming to mind. They are normal. They are natural. And they should be expected. But when they occur, don't be upset, but simply say, oh well, and come back to your focus. Now I'm going to let you do this just for a brief three minutes or so at the end of which time I'll ask you to keep your eyes closed but to start thinking your regular thoughts. But now on your out breath, your focus, other thoughts come to mind, oh well, and back to it. Keep your eyes closed, keep them closed, but start thinking your regular thoughts.
And now slowly, slowly open your eyes. Did any of you find that upsetting or disturbing? Anyone, anything? Did anyone notice any changes in yourself? Please volunteer this now. Any changes in your bodies or anything? This, this brief period of several minutes, anyone? Yes? I felt a little nauseous. Pardon? I felt a little nauseous. Nauseous, okay. Anyone else feel nauseous? I'm contracted. Pardon? I'm contracted. What did you say? Yeah. Anyone else, anything? Yes. My heart rate slowed. Heart rate slowed. Fair enough. How many of you notice your a decrease in your breathing? <laughs> Virtually all. That reflects your decreased metabolism. You are actually changing your genes activity by those th simple three minutes. If you wish to do this, please do so under the. If you're doing it for a medical reason, under the care of a healthcare professional. Uh, but do uh, a good. What we teach is get up in the morning, go to the bathroom, shower if that's your habit. But before breakfast, for do this more than do this more than ten, less than twen twenty minutes. And we've also shown in this paper, soon to be published on PLOS one, that the very first time you do this, you're having changes in your genomic activity, and the more you do so, the more the changes. You will be taking advantage of an inborn, innate, natural resource we have, you have within you. It's cheap, <laughs> cost effectiveness. It costs only the time of doing this, 10 to 20 minutes once or twice a day. Isn't it not worth it to put in that time instead of pills and surgery which don't work on stress anyway? Thank you. Fascinating. I feel much more relaxed than when I stood here at the beginning of the program. Thank you. We have a number of good questions for those who are leaving. So let's, let's begin. We just went through a meditative exercise. Can you tell me, is meditation is more better? Can you do too much? Can you do too much meditation? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm not surprised at the question. <laughs> but um, in our early days of studying transcendental meditation, people were doing rounding, which would be weeks on end of uh, performing a round. One round is one hour. And that would be 20 minutes of meditation, 20 minutes of pranayama breathing in one nostril, out the other nostril. The third 20 minutes would be walking around the room. You do eight a day for months on end by yourself. These people had a distinct tendency to hallucinate. So, <laughs> so in that type of excessiveness, and in fact, I've had the good fortune and honor to be able to work with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And some people in Buddhism believe that the longer you do meditation or evoking the relaxation response, the finer the line becomes between true enlightenment and perhaps losing it mentally. And that's, what, that's why you need a teacher you can trust who can differentiate you and take you down the path. Think of it as an analogy, it doesn't completely hold, of using a drug. There's a correct drug, a correct dosage of a drug. Too much of that drug can have <laughs> side effects. Not, mm -hmm. not taking the drug at all won't have side effects. And that balance is easily achieved. We have not had problems with people evoking the relaxation response 
for 10 to 20 minutes once or twice a day. Okay. Thank you. Um, do atheists enjoy less good health as a consequence of their belief system? Do atheists believe? I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Ted, perhaps you can speak. I don't know either, but I don't think there's any reason to think that. Um, in fact, if you look at most of the great religious leaders of the world, they died pretty young except for Moses, but Jesus died real early. And obviously, it wasn't his intention. To, well, I don't want to say anything about intention, but um, many, many great uh, religious um, figures. For example, um, when I, uh, I, I once debated Deepak um, Chopra, and I asked him, and he said, if you did meditation perfectly and really were one with the cosmos, you, your health would be perfect. And I very casually mentioned to him, who did he think was the greatest saint in India in the 20th century? And he said, Rama Krishna, is it Rama Krishna, I can't remember his name, but he dies in the 1920s and he died of throat cancer. And I said, well, well he, was, if you, he died of throat cancer and it was a miserable death. And he said, well, he took on the karma of other people. And I said, well, you owe it to your, your people who listen to tell you that you know, the consequences of some of this is not good health, but actually could be bad health. So I'm not sure, uh, and uh, my father was a militant atheist and he died at the age of 95 and never lost a beat until the last four hours of his life. <laughs> okay, here's a question about Reiki. What are your thoughts on Reiki? I'm sorry. On Reiki? Reiki. You want to say something on Reiki? Look at different techniques that you could ask questions about. Do they break the train of everyday thinking? Could a massage, um, a muscle separating type of approach like Reiki have that sort of effect? And I think you'll find that many share the commonality of the steps that evoke the relaxation response. Good. What about high blood pressure? Here's a question. Can you be wired for high blood pressure? Can you counteract high blood pressure always through daily meditation, or is some of it just innate? How much is possible there, with meditation? We are distinct individuals. Everyone is different because of their you know, because of their parents, because of the genes that came from your mother and your father. We all have different behaviors. Namely, some people are, eat a lot of salt, other people eat a lot of fat, other people eat a vegetarian diet. The answer to any question of, is the relaxation response useful, including hypertension, was one has to take into account the influence of stress. And what we can say fairly securely is to the extent that any disorder is caused or made worse by stress, then evoking the relaxation response would be useful. And a person with hypertension, if they have a heavy genetic load leading to hypertension, might be less due to stress. But even if it's 10%, Due, due to stress, then that component can be handled. And we found in our studies of hypertension that we can either decrease or eliminate medications, and often whether it can be decreased or eliminated is dependent upon the contribution of stress versus the genetic and other uh, contributors, diet and what have you. Can I say something? I'm not sure I heard the question accurately, but I just evoked for me the idea, no medicine cures, even though the medicine's for a particular condition, no medicine cures everyone with that particular condition. No surgery cures everyone who needs that surgery. And no mind-body um, therapy is omni, uh, omnipotent for any particular condition. It affects stress, but some, there, there's lots of idiosyncrasies. And what I would say, because we're talking about belief and faith, is that, that a belief in faith, whether it's religious or humanism, but some sense of knowing um, uh, something that's transcendent and that puts us into a cosmic scheme of what is truth and what is moral in our lives, in, it fosters patience, resili resilience, and the ability to um, accept 
um, change the things that we want to change and accept the things we can't change. And that's a really potent form of sta status in the universe because um, all of us are, uh, have to deal with the, in, the inevitability that our lives are mortal, that they're, uh, uh, and you know, obviously religious beliefs say that, many religious beliefs say that there's a continuity beyond our, 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 bre our bodily breathing of being alive. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, there's lots, there's nothing invariable and it's all, and that the belief is really, does build re residuals and that could be belief in a human, in the fact that we are all human beings, that, that we're all, however we are, um, important and uh, before our maker or before evolution. Um, what do you think about acupuncture, and how do you view it as a treatment for irritable bowel, bowel syndrome or in other diseases? Um, um, because there's a time limit, I can't, I'm not going to say one sentence. Um, I, you can't let me, you can't put me on that spot, unfortunately. Um, acupuncture does relieve people's irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, the question is whether that's more than a placebo or not. I think that that's not been determined at this point. Good. Um, would either of you be willing to share your own practices for relaxation? How much do you meditate? What, what other I things do you do? I evoke the relaxation response daily. Uh, since um, gaining years, illnesses come along, and I found that um, I want to take care of the stress component, so I do so 10 to 20 minutes um, every morning. I think I need to uh, be, uh, at one point in life I would answer my question, I don't do anything for relaxation, but I pray uh, daily and put on tefillin every day and go to synagogue at least two or three times a week. And that, but I don't do it for stress, I do it because I believe that I have a responsibility to acknowledge the omnipresent in the world, and if that makes me less stressful, I'm really happy. But as I was meditating uh, with uh, Herb's uh, small meditation, I realized that uh, it might be nice to include some meditation in my life because I really felt that um, sometimes standing before the omnipresent is actually frightening and terrifying. And uh, <laughs> that, what Turb did was really great, so uh, I'm going to include that. Here's a question about exercise. Can you speak to exercise and its effect on the body and how important it is? Oh, I think it's very important. If I come across as simply speaking to one point, that is the relaxation response and stress, there should be a whole package of wellness that we have at the general, at what we call the 3RP, Relaxation Response Resiliency Program, where there's not only the relaxation response, but there are other uh, aspects of resilience. And one is exercise, the other is nutrition, the other is positive thinking, uh, other is an element of spirituality, all should be woven together. But these are, and I'll use the words I used earlier in my talk, they're cheap, they take only time, and they're healthy. And it seems to me it's a hell of a lot better than being exposed to the ravages of stress. And there is a way you can evoke the relaxation response with exercise. How many of you jog? Could I have a show of hands? Okay, about 20 or so. How many of you experience the high of running, the runner's high? Could I have that? That is the relaxation response. When you, with the cadence of your feet, left, right, left, right, take over after a while and you break the train of everyday thinking. If you do that normally, it'll occur in the third or fourth mile, but you can evoke the relaxation response in the first mile by focusing on, the, for example, the cadence of your feet, left, right, left, right, and the runner's high will come about in that first mile. And furthermore, when you do so, you evoke the relaxation response even though you have the increased metabolism of jogging. If you're jogging with the same, at the same rate, doing the same amount of physical work, there's an 11% decrease in your oxygen consumption. Same work. 
that's the burst of energy that you feel. Athletes use it if they, in athletics, evoking the relaxation response is, is frequently called being in the zone. When you're in that place where things are just happening, you don't know when you're there, but you know when you were there. People use it all the time in athletic events, including jogging and exercise. Here's a question. How, how would you apply your personal beliefs, the relaxation response, or any other techniques that are spiritual to insomnia? First of all, I would listen to the patient and make sure that I was addressing the patient issue and make sure that I would do something in their original language. And if they were religious, I would certainly have them choose the words, be it uh, Ave Maria, Inshallah Allah, or what have you. Now, with insomnia, this is the essence, what people did in counting sheep. One, two, three, break the train of everyday thinking. And provided sheep aren't meaningful to you, it, uh, uh, counting sheep is a wonderful way to do so. Now, um, what one can do is use the same instructions you are using to evoke the relaxation response while sitting or sitting cross-legged or kneeling and do it lying down. And one could argue that these postures evolved over millennia to keep you from falling asleep. That's why a person sits cross-legged or kneels or stands and sways. But if you do this lying down, it's a component that would help insomnia. Now you've had a previous Longwood seminar here yeah. on insomnia. This could be added to what people have already learned about insomnia. Do the relaxation response lying down and don't give a darn whether you're falling asleep or not. If the thought comes in, am I asleep yet? Oh well, <laughs> peace. Good. And we, I think we have time for one last question. I believe this is for Dr. Kapchuk. Irritable bowel, bowel syndrome has a strong emotional psychological component. Have you done similar studies on placebos with groups who have illnesses and conditions that were not as strongly influenced by stress and emotion? We've done studies like that. Illnesses that are affected by emotions, illnesses that are affected by stress, illnesses that are affected by... Um, the, the, the pressures of life and are really about one's self-appraisal, one's self-evaluation are more susceptible to mind-body effects and more susceptible to uh, placebo effects. And when we actually do um, measurements on hard physiology, it's hard to get that to change. And I, at some point I want to talk to Dr. Benson about hypertension. I think we do get it to change in the laboratory and maybe over time, I'm not sure, but generally, s conditions of stress and, s that, and conditions that are very sensitive to how our emotions are more likely to be affected by mind-body effects. Thank you. Thank you to our guest speakers and to all of you who have been joining us this year for the Longwood Seminars. Thank you. We hope you'll come back next year.